Okay, so 18.2 and 2A. Uh, we've definitely got something that's a lot different to last week, the, the 20 minute AMRAP. We've got a really short, intense conditioning wad and then we're going into a heavy lift. So what I'm gonna do, uh, now that I've seen some athletes do the actual workout, uh, this is gonna be my first impressions based on the uh, live announcement and what I've seen so far. Uh, I'm gonna use Patrick Vellner's performance as just like a bit of a little case study to talk about. Um, I've got some splits written down here for his um, for each of his rounds, but it's not really going to be that kind of workout where, like it was last week, where we're going to be trying to be precise with our pacing strategy per round. It's, it's a little, quite a lot different to that, but it's useful to have a look anyway. Um, so just going through it, he got 4.08 as a total time for part one. Uh, interesting here is just looking at this, how long each round took. As you'd expect, each round took a little bit longer as he went through because of more reps. However, he was able to finish faster on his round of 10 than his round of 9, which leads us to see that he was able to put in a little bit of a sprint at the end and, and had paced it in order to do that, or at least was able to conjure up you know, the power to do that at the end. Uh, what that indicates to me and what, what I believe is a good way to approach this is you have to hit it hard and fast, uh, but if you completely blow up and implode around this middle 7 or 8, then obviously you're not going to be able to finish that strong and you could end up just overcooking it a little bit. So uh, my instructions to people on this are basically you've just got to go out and hit it knowing that it's going to hurt early and it's going to hurt pretty much all the way through. Uh, however, you've got to get to this round seven mark and um, not be completely out of it and be able to maintain a similar pace if not faster in the back end. So um, I'm going to talk about pacing a little bit soon, but uh, that's, that's kind of the main thing there. Um, in terms of the cleans, he was able to get, obviously he finished in 408, so he's got a lot of time on these cleans. Uh, he got one, two, three, four, five, six attempts in. He missed his fourth attempt at 315, then he got it, and then he went for another one in the dying seconds. Um, but main things to note here, he rested like two and a half minutes before going for his first one, which is pretty smart. I don't think anyone should go faster than like two minutes after they finish the wad. It should basically be like, sitting down, lying down, getting your breathing back in order. Uh, then he went like a minute later and got this weight here, which is probably about like 70% of his max, something like that. Uh, and then about just over a minute later, he went again. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, basically it was a, a minute rest between all these, these attempts here. Uh, he may have gone just a little bit early on this one. Uh, he, he missed it the first time and then he got it the second time and that was it. Um, the... The movements themselves I want to talk about. So with the dumbbell squat, two key things. Rack position, how you hold the dumbbells on your shoulders is going to be important and needs to be something that you're fairly comfortable with. Uh, I saw athletes today you know, holding it in their hand and resting it on their shoulders like that, but still having the, the grips in their hand, uh, and that worked okay. But I also saw athletes who were placing it on the shoulders and then holding onto the head of the dumbbell uh, a bit more, which which is allowed this time, different to the lunges last year, uh, and that was that looked more comfortable for the upper body. It was a little bit more challenging to then transition into the hands and onto the floor in between each round. So I would encourage you to play around with both, knowing that the advantage of holding onto the handle the whole time is that you can easily transition, uh, but it does tax the upper body probably a little bit more. And the advantage of resting it on the shoulders and just holding maybe more on the heads of it is it's easier while you're doing the squats on the upper body, but it may be harder for you to transition on and off. So you just need to make sure you've, you practice to that before you start. Uh, then placement of the dumbbells in a place that's very close to the barbell, but doesn't interfere with you doing your burpees is also pretty important there. Okay. Uh, in terms of cycle speed on the dumbbell squat, you can manipulate your cycle speed a little bit. Like if you're... If you're good on this movement, really strong on this movement, you can probably capitalize a little bit by increasing your cycle speed. Uh, but I think for most people, if they try to push the speed on the squats, it's going to blow up their legs and they're going to get pretty burning in the legs. So I think there's a little bit of wiggle room on that movement. But I think most people are better off just staying at like a steady, reasonable cadence and just making sure they're not pausing for too long at the top or anything like that. With the burpee, it's different. So... Um, in terms of, first of all, the footwork, the best people, like I'm talking like the regionals and games level guys who are 
probably trying to do this thing in under five minutes. You've got no other option but to come straight up out of the burpee, jump straight over the bar, probably turn in midair and go straight into the next burpee. Then there's not really much room for like coming up, stepping up to the bar and going over uh, or even jumping over and then turning around and then going down. Most of you guys are going to need to turn and jump in midair and move, do the fast style. Uh, if you are not aiming for like under six minutes, you can probably get away with um, some stepping here and there, but you should still be focusing on no pausing and fluid movement throughout those burpees to keep it at a pace that is challenging and it's going to be hurting, but is not letting you crash too much towards the very end of it. Uh, so that's basically covering the cycle speed. You can manipulate the cycle speed of the burpee much more than I think you can change the cycle be- speed of the, of the squat. Here's where uh, you can get an advantage if you're able to cycle those burpees fast and, and especially in the last uh, couple of rounds, like really put the hammer down at the end with that fast speed on the burpee. Uh, you'll have a big advantage if you're able to do that. Uh, in terms of pacing now, just the overall pacing strategy, the sevens are just halfway. So when you get, there's 55 total reps on the dumbbells and 55 total reps on the burpees. So if you get to, when you get to round seven, even though you're seven rounds in, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a head fuck because you're actually only halfway through the workout in terms of the total number of reps. Okay, so just remember that when you're doing it. Um, and if you look at Velna, he was half, pretty much halfway through his four minute time here when he finished this, these seven rounds. He still had the bigger rounds to go, which are the sort of the harder rounds. Less transitions, but but still pretty tough going here. So um, don't sprint these hands here like crazy hard if you can't back it up on this back end with the eights, nines, and tens. That's where the second half and the the main work is in this in this first piece. Okay, so sevens are just halfway. Two and a, two to two and a half minutes rest before your first clean. Uh, that's going to depend on how long it actually takes you to do this part and how much you can afford to rest but really you're going to need quite a bit of time for that heart rate to come back down some blood to flush through the legs so yeah it's at least two minutes even if you're taking like eight minutes to do this other stuff you probably want to have about two minutes on uh, of rest anyway uh yeah and just on that as well i don't think for in terms of the leaderboard and, and getting the best result it's smart to sandbag this workout for this workout uh, i think that'll really um really hurt you if you're 20 or 30 seconds behind your potential on this one just to try and get a couple, a bit more weight on this one. Um, the other part of that is, don't forget there's a tie break. So let's say two people get the same clean weight, they'll then count back to how long the first part takes uh, as a tiebreaker, and then that'll determine where you are on the leaderboard. There's gonna be a lot of people pulled on similar weights on the cleans, so let's, uh, let's make sure we're putting a decent effort in here, and you should really be fit enough to recover in a couple of minutes and, and get some heavy cleans up. Okay, otherwise you probably haven't done enough training. Um, Four to six attempts on the barbell, that'll be depending on how much time you have and how accurate you are with your cleans, but yeah, no more than six attempts, I would suggest anyone. Uh, And then thinking about opening at about, say, 60 or 70%. I had some guys today wish they'd opened a bit heavier and just bought themselves a little bit of time. Uh, So, you know, I think Velna opened at about 60%, but... But yeah, maybe in hindsight, they, those athletes would go a bit heavier to start, even 70%. Uh, and then finishing, depending on you know where your strengths are, how much the wad hurt you, I think you should be aiming to try and finish north of 90% of your max. Uh, and then I've seen some people PR their, their cleans today, which is, which is awesome. But it just depends where you are in your sort of strength cycle or strength development as well and how you perform in these kind of scenarios. Some other things that I haven't got written down here, but that are also important, are, um, it probably is worth putting like odd numbers of weights on there so you don't get stuck in like clusters of people all on like 225 pounds. If you can just put on another couple of couple of pounds, that can be the difference between like jumping up a big, a big level on the leaderboard. So that's worth considering. Um, I think that's, that's about it for now. Oh, the one, one last thing is the power clean versus the full clean. Have a good think about which one you want to do. You are allowed to power clean instead of full clean, although your legs will be somewhat smoked from, obviously, all these squats and burpees beforehand. I think uh, mo- pretty much everyone I saw today, even the ones that said they think they might power clean, they ended up reverting to a squat clean or wishing that they'd done squat cleans. So 
I'm leaning towards encouraging most, pretty much everyone to do squat cleans unless they're particularly weak in the, in the squat pattern uh, and, and they're pretty powerful in the pull. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, squat cleans probably going to be the go. Guys, uh, I'm going to... Is this rolling? Guys, I'm going to talk through the, just the warm-up. Uh, if that starts, stop me and we'll, we'll launch that. All right, I'm going to try and fit this warm-up in. Okay, so warm-up for 18.1, 18.2. And 2A, sorry. Uh, first thing, your pre warm up. Before the warm up starts, read the workout description, read the movement standards. You've got to be crystal clear on everything in there. You then have got to organise your judge and your camera person if you need it, and you've got to brief them. You've got to make sure they know the workout description and the movement standards. Very important. Then you're going to set up your video if you've got a camera going, and you've also got to set up your equipment, have everything laid out ready to go. Because we don't want and go, go, go to your bag, get all the things you need, have all that sorted, so you don't have to think about it, and you can just get into your warm-up and get into it, okay? Once you, uh, then the two things to do before we start the general and specific warm-up, particularly if you're like a tighter athlete and you know your rack position's a bit tight or your hips are a bit tight, a bit of movement prep here, so um, some rack position work uh, and some dynamic hip mobility would be pretty good as well. Uh, Kind of hip complex or something similar. We've got a link to that. If you guys need it, we'll post that in the comments. Um, in terms of like activation work, if you've got specific things that you like to do that you know are part of your routine, here's a chance to do them here as well. Uh, we're then going to go into a general five minute just easy bike with five second bursts every minute. So let's start to get the heart rate up, get the blood flow going. And then our specific warm up has three parts to it. The first one is just three rounds of starting to move now, moving patterns that we use in the wad. So some 15 air squats, 15 banded good mornings, and 15 push-ups. You can mix up the grips on the push-ups and kind of just get a feel for the activation of the upper body there. The second part of the warm-up is going to involve us doing the clean primer that we normally give out. Uh, we'll put a link to that as well for those that don't know that. Uh, then you're going to work up to about 70 to 80 percent of your 1RM clean. We need a weight here that's enough to get the CNS firing, get you feeling like, okay, we're, we're moving some heavy weight here but not so heavy that you're like catching it and you're getting crushed and like getting a little bit fatigued before the workout. So that'll be different for everyone depending on the kind of athlete you are, okay? Um, as you're building up to that one out of that 80%, 70, 80%, on every set or every couple of sets, I want you to do three sets. Oh, do a set of five dumbbell squats and five burpees over the bar. So just sprinkle that in throughout your warm up in a non-fatiguing way, but you're starting to get into the zone of those two movements. Okay, uh, and then once you've built up to that clean, you've done the movements that are coming up in the conditioning piece, then set your equipment all up for the workout, and then at what you think your pace will be in the workout, let's just try 10 dumbbell squats and 10 burpees, uh, and like race pace, just to figure out how hard you're gonna hit your cycle through these and hit these. Um, once you've done all that, you can then probably rest maybe uh, somewhere between six and 10 minutes before you start, which should be pretty good. Make sure you've got at least a light sweat on and your heart rate's up a little bit before you start. If you need to jump on the bike a little bit down the back end of the warm-up to make sure you've got that blood flow going, you can do that as needed as well. Sound good? All right. Thanks, guys. So this last piece, we're just talking about cool-down protocol uh, and then also a protocol for training that same day if you've just done the workout and if you're used to training uh, large volumes and you're making sure that you're not detraining throughout the open uh, we do get some of our guys or most of our guys to do a small training session after the workout as well to touch on the movements that might come up later in the open or later in the season as well um, these these should be taken as like options that you may or may not decide to do depending on what you're used to doing uh, and depending how you actually pull up after the workout. If you pull up really sore and really smash CNS wise or, or, or you know quad pain wise or anything like that, then you probably won't do um, all these options or even any of them. It just, just depends on your own situation. But here's, here's one option that we, we've provided to some of our athletes today. Uh, it's a uh, 400 meter walk after the workout uh, with box breathing, just breathing in and out through the nose, uh, mm -hmm. a nice even rate of one, 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 one ratio of like say four seconds in, four seconds hold, four seconds out, four seconds hold, something like that. Just to down regulate a little bit and just to process what's happened and have a think about the workout. Go for a nice easy walk on their own with that one. When they come back in the gym, straight away post-workout carbohydrate, 
protein and some hydration, just making sure we're starting to refuel straight away. And then back on the bike for just nice and easy five minutes, trying to keep flushing those legs out that have just done a lot of work. Uh, then in terms of the training, so this, this stuff down here, I've got some clean pools in here as an option for some of the athletes who weren't particularly fried from the workout, but we know they're going to be doing a re-attempt, say, on Monday, and we, I just want them to feel that heavy weight again a couple more times uh, that's around about the weight they're going to be shooting for on the next attempt. Okay, so not crazy heavy, but just maybe something like three by two at around about like 100% of their max clean, something like that. This is only if I think that they're still feeling reasonably flesh and... Um, yeah, not, not necessarily for everyone, okay? Uh, then we move into stuff that I think most people should be okay to do. Just some maintenance work, some strict handstand push-ups and some strict chins for some gymnastic strength maintenance. Uh, say three sets, three to five sets of like three to five or three to ten reps, depending on your ability with those movements. Nothing fatiguing, maybe more like a seven out of ten effort on those movements just to touch on them. Uh, and then we're going to go on a bike. The purpose of the bike is just to sort of flush things out a little bit more in the legs continuously for 10 minutes. But then every two minutes, you're going to jump off and complete a set of, say, 10 to 18 chest of bars on the two minutes. So every, so you end up doing five sets of those. Uh, I think we want to accumulate at least around about 50 because chest of bars are probably going to come up later in the open. Um, if you're feeling good and you want to actually challenge us a little bit more, you can do some more challenging sets up in the teens. Um, or you can pull it back and just work some, some quality and tick off on the skill. Okay, but definitely this piece is probably the most important out of all these. Then finish with another five minute easy bike to flush and stretching, nice static stretching for like 20 minutes afterwards just to really um, round out the day and, and down regulate. And that's, that's, these are the kinds of things I'm, I'm recommending to my guys after this one. So I hope you found that useful. It's definitely something that's a lot different to last week in terms of the, the test that we're seeing this week. So I'm expecting a lot of movement on the leaderboard. Uh, I think this is a workout that upon re-attempting, a lot of people are going to improve a lot. So review your videos and if you think that there's a, uh, a couple of little things in there that you can tweak, by all means, give it another go on, on say, Monday or Tuesday. Um, I think anyone will just naturally improve on this workout from just being more familiar on it the second time around. Even if they don't have like a big dramatic um, strategy change, it'll be just purely by feel that they're able to get a little bit more out on, on one or both of the components. All the best, guys. Have fun.